Hello and welcome to another spooky episode of Saved by the 90s. My name is Adam Patterson. With me today is a guy who continues to trick or treat well into his 20s, Mr. Ken Bakley. Hey, Ken. Hello. Actually, funny story about that uh, the joke that you just made. I've never liked it, even when I was a little kid. I, really? I, 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 yeah, no, no. I just, hmm. It was very tiring. I just hmm. want candy. I like, you know, there's a, it, it felt like too much, you know. I like costumes and I like candy, but I don't know, something in my brain. Well, we did establish last week, last month, that I'm uh, no fun at all, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just, I just right. couldn't c- compartmentalize the two of them together. I loved trick or treating. I, I, I knew I knew when it was time to stop. Like I, I didn't. I wasn't like one of those weird kids that went trick or treating well past when I should have. Like I, I stopped at a normal time, but I always kind of wanted to. I mean, still, like I still kind of want to go trick or treating. Just the free I, candy. I, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I always, I always also wore very elaborate costumes so i was always looking for that that like kind of gratification as well like people being impressed by my costumes and by by elaborate costumes i mean elaborate costumes for like an eight-year-old or whatever like (laughs) by today's standards you know and what you would see at like a comic convention or something it's nothing it's like garbage but (laughs) You know, I, I think that is a part of it. I think you have to have to actually like the like you know the uh, process of mm-hmm. coming up with and, and wearing a costumes. And I I don't know. I could I wasn't very enthusiastic, so I I stopped b- long before I, I would have felt any you know other 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 you know re- reason to. Ba- basically, like you stopped way before everybody else. You you were just like yeah. as, as soon as you could stop trick or treating, you stopped trick or treating. Yeah, basically, like I said, we established last month that I am no fun. You you were one of those kids that you didn't go out trick or treating. You just like helped give out candy at your house. Yes, that is exactly right. <laughs> one, of those, one of those lame kids. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, that's, that's the that's thing. Okay. It, it was a, a, a good, significant portion of my early childhood was just, you know, it's the opposite of what it's supposed to be. It was my parents trying to convince me to go out more. <laughs> <laughs> I did not develop any social skills for about, I don't know, the first <laughs> decade of my life. <laughs> uh, oh, that's okay. Uh, in this special Halloween episode, we are going to be looking at four sci-fi horror films released throughout the decade. So prep those airlocks and get ready to log in because this is Saved by the 90s. Ready and get a firm grip on your Halloween goodie bag because you're in for an entire evening of Halloween horror courtesy of Monster Vision. Kicking things off this month is a technology-infused thriller starring Edward Furlong and featuring an ample amount of 90 CG, something we'll no doubt be discussing with all of our titles this month. Released on April 22nd, 1994, and directed by John Flynn, this is Brain Scan. Imagine a game that knows your fears, fulfills your fantasies, your mind. Now, imagine the game is real. Play it, Michael. Brain Scan, the ultimate head trip. Rated R at theaters April 22nd. A teenager is part of an interactive video game where he kills innocent victims. Later, the murders become real. Hmm. I mean, no, that's not true. No. That's not actually not true. They don't become real later. They are real to they begin are. with. Yeah. And this is this is actually one of the biggest issues I have with this movie is the logistics about how the whole quote unquote game works. Because what you have here, and I'm just going to I'm just going to break it down, break down the plot very simply. Edward Furlong is this kind of he seems a little introverted. He he's sort of a loner kid who he's all into like horror movies and stuff and and gory video games, but he's also like 
seems to be like super into technology. Like he has this insane like battle station in his in his room and uh, quite a gaming chair, too, by the way. And he gets his best friend tells him about this ad for a game called Brain Scan that he that he sees in Fangoria magazine. And he ends up calling it and, and they send him the, the, the CD ROM for this game that supposedly like is this like VR, like it gets inside your head and it's like super realistic, but it just turns out that like, I, I guess it just hypnotizes you to kill people. This is I, what I've I'm got to, uh, I've got to ask did, did Fangoria pay for that product placement? Uh, yeah, I don't know. That was that was kind of funny. <laughs> that, that Fango plays a pretty pretty larger yeah. role in this in this movie. <laughs> I just don't understand how the whole thing works because the first time he goes into the game, now they said at the beginning they're like, "Oh, there's four parts. This game is told in four parts, and you got to go through every part, or else there's going to be dire consequences." So he does the first part and he's like, holy crap, that was, that was wild. Like that felt so real. Like I've never played a game like that before. And then he finds out that the person who he killed in the game was actually a person who lived in his neighborhood. After that, uh, so the, the, the second one I believe was, was the second one that, that when he was to cover up the evidence, I believe. The, the weird thing is, after that first time, every time he, like, played the game, quote-unquote, it was like he just got up from his chair and was completely cognizant of the game. So, yes. after that first time, actually, I think it was the second time, because the second time he recorded it, so it was, like, the third, the, starting with the third time, it seemed like the, the movie just threw its own rules out the window, and they were like... There was really no game at that point. It was just him sitting in the chair, putting in the CD-ROM, and then just getting up and doing what they wanted him to do. Like, there wasn't an actual, like, hypnosis game thing that was going on. It was all just real, real life. And yeah, it, it then kind of accidentally turns the movie into less you're being hypnotized into murder rather than you put in the game and now you feel you have permission to murder. Yeah, and it was like for the second for the last two discs, it was more just that uh, the trickster, that trickster character basically blackmailing him into doing these things to cover up the, the initial murder that he made. And then, of course, you find out that, and this is a spoiler, the whole thing was part of Brain Scan. Everything that we saw was Brain Scan. This podcast is actually Brain Scan. Oh, yes. And so it was, it was sort of like that sort of like movie Existence. The, the Cronenberg film where it was like a game within a game. But so, so I guess like they sort of wrote themselves out of that corner because, which I, I don't give them a pass for, no. by the way, I do not no. give them a pass for it because they broke their own rules and they did, they did, they, they made some really crazy decisions. And up until the, the final reveal where you learned that it was all a game, you're just like, there's just no way. Like, this is so ridiculous. Uh, like, the, the whole relationship that he has with the neighbor and how, like, he does that. He, like, rec records her and, like, she knows that he's recording her, but she's, like, okay with it. So she's, like, taking her shirt off in front of the, the window and stuff. Like, I, I, I'm not buying that whole thing. And then there was, like, the fact that they were both supposed to be 16 years old. And there was this really weird, like, sexualization of her character the whole time. And I just, I felt like it was just way too much and unnecessary. Yeah. Especially because, like, she's topless, like, multiple times in this movie, which is, like, just, it's just really weird that they're, like, mm -hmm. kids. And I also didn't really like that they 
started off with Edward Furlong, like secretly f- spying on her because then it establishes him as like being a dirtbag creep. So you don't like him from no. the, the beginning either. And then the, the, and then the thing is like, they don't do anything to really establish the character beyond that. So all you're left with is that this dude is probably like a school shooter. He's an incel school shooter. <laughs> like that's, that's Edward Furlong's character in this. So yeah, this is a movie. This is a movie about a guy who was already concocting his defense that the video game is what made him kill all those people. Exactly. Exactly. And, and and that is literally what this movie is about. Like the fact that it's, it's a video game character, this trickster who's like coaxing him, coaxing him into murdering people, including the girl who he likes, but I, I guess th- does uh, th- that's all kind of nebulous too. Like the fact that like, you don't really know. Cause at first it seems like she's really into him, but then like she isn't cause I, I don't know that, that whole, the whole relationship thing is all messed up, but yeah. At any rate, uh, it's, I don't know, man, this it's just, it, it's, it's a, it's a weird, it's a weird movie that, really plays strangely in 2021 and i really just don't i'm just not buying the the things that happen even though we learned that it's all part of the game like it's still it's still too much like the fact that she she's like saying that she loves him and stuff and even within the context of this like game world you're just like what Huh? Yeah. Like it's <laughs> Well, this now adds to my own theory uh that I that that I've concocted with uh that uh this is the uh it's not a it's not all within the game. It's all of the, it's the game as described by him as part of his legal defense in the trial of why he be, you know, why he became a serial killer and murdered half of his neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, that's that that could be that could be actually like it was actually it was he killed his best friend jeez wow this so there's layers going on here yeah, this, brain scan this, 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 and, and trick, i guess i guess trickster represents like his his uh like inner his psyche or something it's all from the trial mhm hmm. interesting one one thing that i noted that i took note of was that at the beginning when he gives out his phone number, he mentions the 717 area code. And I was like, "Uh Oh, I used to, I used to live in the 717 area code. So then it, it made me like look it up to see if it was just a random thing. And and I noticed that one of the writers on this, Andrew Kevin Walker was from Altoona, Pennsylvania. So I figured that that's probably where the 717 area code thing came from. Uh, notably, the this guy, in addition to writing Brain Scan, he also wrote Seven and Eight Millimeter and Sleepy Hollow. I'm so. also seeing here that he uh, did uh, script doctor work on Event Horizon, which we'll talk about oh, soon, yeah. uh, and the game, which I believe we talked about two months ago. Mm-hmm, yeah. So he had a good 90s. He did. Yeah, he did have a good 90s. He also did Nerdland, which was from 2016 and that was absolutely horrible so so i'll reiterate he had a good 90s yeah he had a good 90s <laughs> i i loved the use of 90s cg in brain scan because it yeah. is uh i don't even know how to describe it egregious it, like uh, <laughs> intense it's We've got, like you like we mentioned earlier we've got a lot of 90 cg to talk about this month but this i think is the peak of it the uh i loved the scene where he like like morphed into or like melded with trickster like that whole scene when they were like becoming one that was great (laughs) the the use of technology in this is is something else too i mean this movie was way ahead of its time he has edward furlong's character has a like an AI assistant 
in this. Yeah. Named Igor, and he uses Igor to place calls. So this is like a precursor to Siri. Mm-hmm. But the but the funny thing is like it's way too smart. Like this AI is yeah. way too smart for 1994. Like come on, we're getting it's a little ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, although it does feed into the uh, movies. This movie is extremely 1994, and particularly in that kind of like dichotomy of uh, you're uh, <laughs> uh, you're either really into technology or you have a normal life (laughs) which i will say maybe i'm just forgetting but now that i'm trying to think about it for a minute does not seem to be an overwhelmingly common trope in the 20 in 2021 no definitely not which is actually funny like that is an interesting point where you had movies back then where it's like oh he's he's into computers that that kid that kid's really into computers and you just don't see that trope anymore that's not that's not something that's common because everybody has phones and computers and stuff like that now there was some pretty uh there was some good uh, well i don't know if good is the word but there was some very 90s prosthetics in this as well you had the character of trickster who looked like he's like some kind of reject from little monsters with Howie Mandel. I don't, I'm not sure how I feel about this character because I don't, I frankly just don't know the point of the character to begin with. Like it's it's a truly fascinating performance. (laughs) It's just, it was like, uh, it was like drop dead Fred sort of. Uh, but, but with drop dead Fred, it's like you would at least know like who Fred is and where he, why, why, why he exists within the narrative. Whereas with trickster, you're just like, uh, why, why is he here? Like what is, who, who, where'd he come from? What's this person's, what's his purpose? Why is he trying to get him, this kid to kill somebody and then cover it up? And then of course, this is also can be explained away by the ending, which again, I would say is like not excusable like the way that it ends you're just it's it's just so easy to just be just chalk everything everything ridiculous that happens up to that point to the fact that oh it was all just a game the whole movie is just a vr game so that means that literally anything can happen it's completely ridiculous like like frank langella is in here as the detective and he freaking just shoots edward furlong at the end and that's what makes him wake up from the game and it's, I, I don't know. I feel like everything is a cop out in this. Now, with all that being said, yes, all of that being said, I still think that this is an incredibly fun movie for even how horrible it is. I, this is the second time I've seen this movie and uh, I don't know. There's just, there's something that, that I find inherently fun with it, even though I think that it is a, a very bad movie it is a movie where as you're watching it you can just kind of get the impression of the better movie it could have been yeah. like it, it it's one of those movies where it's where it's badness and it's blandness and it's just general incompetence almost seems to happen in spite of a premise that feels like it should carry a lot more than it does yeah i mean you have a concept here that i think is it's a good concept other movies have dabbled in this idea as well. I don't think too many movies before this have dabbled in the idea of uh, like a VR experience. I don't even know how you would describe it, but I think it was, it was relatively unique for the time. And you know, there, there were some cool concepts in here and the way that it ended, it was sort of like the game. You know, where where it all turned out to be part of it, which, yeah. again, is uh, it's something that works in the game. It's not something that works here. But no, yeah, I would say that the first time I saw this, I thought it was like funny. And there were a lot of, of silly moments that worked for me on maybe like a, a nostalgic or just goofy 90s fun level. Revisiting it, uh, I found it to be a little bit more of a chore to get through. 
Still a lot of goofiness, though. Another thing I'll add before we finish is that the score for this, if you look at the credits, the, the score is composed by the like, president, George S. Clinton, who has done a lot of soundtracks. But I feel like no matter how many times you see that name and you know who, that it's just a composer name that, there's always going to be a second where you might think, wait, that George, that George Clinton? Clinton? Yeah, I did, the, I did the exact same thing when I saw the name come up in the opening credits. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> This is going to be a funky soundtrack. And then it's yeah, like, oh, like, wait, no, not it, that one. Is Brain Scan going to have a funk soundtrack? <laughs> it's a choice. It's like, uh, like PCU. Mm -hmm. Next up is this sexy sci-fi horror film that resulted in three sequels, much to the delight of teenage boys everywhere, directed by Roger Donaldson and released on July 7th, 1995. This is Species. We now have a new sequence of DNA with instructions on how to combine it with ours. They don't know how to find her. You created a monster, now you want us to hunt it down and kill it. They don't know how to kill her. We decided to make it female so that it would be more controllable. More controllable. <laughs> I guess you guys uh, don't get out much. They only know if they fail. We gotta get to her before she gives birth. It's the end of us all. Species rated R starts Friday, July 7th. A group of scientists tried to track down and trap a killer alien seductress before she successfully mates with a human. Uh, before we start, I, I was thinking about what you said a moment ago about, you know, three sequels released to the delight of teenage boys everywhere. And I was thinking while I was watching this movie, like, there's probably you don't actually have to go far to get to like a, a reading of it where it's, you know, a commentary on like general societal fear and anxiety over like women having autonomy over their own bodies and lives. Uh, but then again, I have to know that that did not cross the mind of any uh, studio executive involved in the making or distribution of this film. Absolutely not. And I think that that was also lost on most audience members revisiting it now. I think that you, you can very easily draw that conclusion. And I think that this is an interesting one to revisit in 2021 because there is that sort of like other side of the coin that you can sort of read from it. But back when this came out, it was not that whatsoever. I, I mean, it was not even close. This was the one, the one about the naked alien woman who tried, tried to mate with guys like that's what this yeah. movie was absolutely known for and yeah, I, I was thinking i know what i i don't know what the advertising of this movie looked like but i know what the advertising for this movie looked like. yeah yeah and and this was actually i first saw this movie when i was in seventh grade and i attended it was of my very first co-ed sleepover so there were there were boys and girls at this sleepover and we watched Species, and we watched Barbed Wire, starring Pamela Anderson. And those were the movies that we watched. <laughs> it was a very uh, awkward time for me. It was fun, but it was very awkward. I was very nervous about the whole situation. It's, not, it's never a not awkward time of life for anybody, though. <laughs> true. Absolutely true. I, I at least got to enjoy, like, watching the movies and like focusing on those and not like trying to make sure that I don't do something dumb to embarrass myself in front of all of my friends. Mm. But at any rate species, what'd you think of it? Eh. Yeah. Eh. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I think we're going back to this is kind of a, a movie that, is so caught between exactly how to go about what it's about that it is ultimately not anything. Yeah, I mean, when you want when you look at this, it's it's sort of an alien ripoff in a lot of ways. I mean, certainly a lot of the design work is biting off of of Alien, and I think also I don't know if it's in this one, maybe one of the sequels when like when the alien, when, when they give birth, uh, a lot of times there's like sort of chest bursting type scenes. I don't, I don't think it was in this one. Maybe it was in one of the other ones. Uh, but I, I just, just to go back to what, what you said, it, I think that it, it, the series had the opportunity 
to explore some interesting gender tropes and and stuff like that and and um it, but it just doesn't go anywhere close to having anything of substance to say it's just about a female alien who wants to propagate her species and that's like pretty much it and then you have this like random group of people put together by the government who are supposed to stop it but the thing is like they're they're i don't know if they're just incompetent or what but the whole time i'm like why does this group exist like you you, they don't seem to be adding or contributing much to the whole thing and then you have so you have like michael madsen in here as like i guess a hitman is that what he did he's like uh i think he's a hitman or a some kind of bounty hunter or something yeah, that's kind of what I was talking about in the sense that you have these characters where the longer that they're on the screen, the less you know what th- they're doing or who they are. Yeah, you have uh, Forrest Whitaker in here as perhaps the most baffling character. They bring him on because he's an empath and they're they're hoping that he will like be able to t- tell them like what the alien is like thinking and what her mindset is and stuff like that. But he's such a weird character in this that you're just like, what is this man's purpose? Like he, it's like a, it's like a a parody of what an empath is where he's like, she's feeling fear. Like he, like he knows exactly what she's feeling at all times. And it's just, kind of silly his character Mm -hmm. natasha henstridge plays the alien sill and ben kingsley is the scientist who's like taking care of her or raising her or whatever interestingly interestingly michelle williams is the young version of sill so these aliens they grow very fast so they turn into teenagers and then they like go into this like cocoon and then come out as like fully grown adult women. And then Mm -hmm. they, uh, that's when they they try to go out and breed. But the, the, the the interesting thing here is that they can like detect diseases and like low quality breeding stock, I guess you could say. So often you know, when she, fi- she, she finds somebody and then she just de- detects this problem in them. And then she's just like, okay, um, we can, um, we're done here. And inevitably the man will be like, oh no, we're not. And then she'll kill him. And that's pretty much how that goes. I do love that Michael Madsen ended up being the perfect breeding specimen, which is, I thought was pretty funny. <laughs> I did want to say, when you mentioned Ben Kingsley, it did remind me uh, of this ridiculous observation I had at the start of the movie when the credits are going. I had a lot of thoughts about the credits of the movies we're talking about. This Three month, and a half minute long credits. I timed first, it. That's the first thing about it. I timed it. <laughs> <laughs> Second thing was it says starring in alphabetical order and started with Ben Kingsley. It just so happened that it, Kingsley was first. But I thought for a second they were going to list the cast alphabetically by, by first, by first name. name. That'd be so funny. <laughs> but no. Oh man, that would have been great if they did that. So wait, uh, Ben Kingsley was first. Is that uh, it's? Yeah, I guess. Uh, that, uh, I guess that makes sense. So I was just tra- checking the, the cast list here to make sure that was correct. But then I've got like Mark uh, Mark Helgenberger who starts with an H. Yeah. But an H, and, H comes for K. And Natasha Henstridge too. I think she got an end introducing. Oh really? Is it possible that maybe Helgenberger got like like Kingsley gets like a single slate credit, but maybe Helgenberger got like on one with two names in it? Maybe. So it comes later. Oh, Mark Hel- Helgenberger is also starring. Wait, uh, wait, and then, wait, wait a minute. So, 
So it does Kingsley. That's weird. It does. <laughs> I'm now. I'm now just going to go through them and read them to you in real time. Ben Kingsley. These are so slow. Michael Madsen. <laughs> oh yeah, it's brutal. It's like really boring titles too. Alfred Molina. It's just over like footage of space right yeah, now. It's, just, it's, so, it's so boring. Forrest Whitaker. So yeah, alphabetical. <laughs> Yeah, but still, why was Marge Helenberger, Helgenberger... She's also starring. Also starring. But why Why wouldn't she be in the main cast list when she is... Oh, Whip Hubbley, Michelle Williams get chair of slate Wait. and introducing oh. Natasha Henstridge. Who does Michelle Williams get? Whip Hubbley. Oh, Whip Hubbley. Got I it. hope, listeners, you just enjoyed We Rewatch the Credits and of Species and Read Them to You. Yeah, we re- re- rewatched like the first 15 seconds of the three and a half minute credits. Yes. The mm-hmm. most boring ass <laughs> credits ever. I remember yet, the, 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 those, those cr- I've seen some bad credits. I remember there was this one movie that was sent to me. It was like one of the very first screeners that ever got sent to me. I was so excited. Never heard of the movie. It was just like no budget indie movie. And I, it was a DVD. I put it in and it, I'm not even joking. It had 10 minutes of opening credits. I'm not even kidding. 10 minutes straight up opening credits. It was just stock footage of a car driving through like the mountains, like a, like a mountainous area for 10 minutes. <laughs> and I, I like, I just, my mind was blown and I was like, is this what it, this, is this what it's all about? This is what movies are about. <laughs> yeah. Was it like a thing where if they didn't have it, it wouldn't even meet the definition of a feature? Yeah. Like if you took the 10 minutes and credits out, it'd be like 62 minutes yeah, long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because the movie, after the, the really long credits, the movie started, and then there was another like just B roll montage of like nature and stuff. And I remember just it just being so awful. Anyway, back to species. I will say that I. Quite enjoyed the practical effects in this movie. Thought the practical effects were good. Now, there is a lot of CG in this movie, too, which is not good. But, no. But, <laughs> but it's good. But it's good, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's really rough. It is, it is very rough. But, I mean, this is 1995, though, you know? So they were, they were swinging for the fences, with the uh, the effects in this, and again, I will reiterate that the practical effects were really good. I thought, like all of the the just the creepy alien stuff, I thought was 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 quite good. Just the actual look of the alien itself when they did the CG one and all of that was uh, tremendously bad. Mm-hmm. There's a great dance club scene in this. Oh, I mean, if we're talking about I think a a recurring theme on our podcast, 90s movies was set in really elaborate looking clubs. Yeah. It's great. Love it. Oh, yeah. When when I see this movie, I think that this is like sort of the the quintessential 90s horror movie. Like it's got all it checks all the boxes for me. Like it's got. Like teenagers, everything, everything about it looks kind of it's like too slick and like too glossy and just lame people wearing lame clothes and just everything about it looks so corny. And I, I kind of, I kind of like all that. And like in nineties horror is just generally regarded as not being on the same like caliber as eighties. And it's like, you see movies like this and you're like, yeah, I can kind of, I can kind of see it. Mm-hmm. Obviously that's like, a sweeping generalization of the entire genre yeah. over in a, a decade. Right. And there are tons and tons of great entries in that. But um, yeah, I, I thought that they also try to shoehorn in this really ridiculous love story with Michael Madsen and, uh, and the, and, and um, uh, what's her, uh, Marge Helgenberger's character, which I don't know why they would, why they would do that. And then, they and there's a scene where Alfred Molina's character, who plays a doctor, gets seduced by Syl and killed. And I'm like, "What are you stupid? 
You were so, you were an yeah. idiot. You are such yeah. an idiot. How do you not know? Like, how do you not know that that's like the way that this movie, and in fact, the whole series, pretty much, the way that it portrays the men is both hilarious and uh, borderline offensive on just how stupid they all are. <laughs> I was about to observe the same thing how stupid all the men are in this movie. And they're all dumb. They're all just like complete idiots who are not thinking with their brains whatsoever. I mean, it's just the, the Molina scene I thought was particularly egregious, but it happens a lot in the movie. It's just, I don't, I don't know. Like, frankly, he deserved to die for, for what, yeah. for not realizing like, this guy actually thought yes. that this was a normal thing and he just went with it. Just to, to be clear, he's down in a bar. He, if I'm remembering the movie correctly, he like hits on some women. They reject him. He goes back up to his hotel room and Natasha Henstridge character, her character still is in the hotel room. Yeah. And she just instantly strips completely naked, and he's just like, "All right, let's go." He doesn't question it at all. He just he just rolls with it. Which and, and that's the, that's the thing about this movie that immediately lets you know that this is really nothing more than just like an exploitation film. Is the fact that like every scene, Natasha Henstridge, like every scene that they possibly can, they're having these women just take their tops off. Like every scene. There's no reason for it. They're just stripping down, stripping down all the time. Because you would think that this alien would know, like she would detect the, the disease or whatever, whatever makes them a non-suitable mate before she strips down. Now, I mean, maybe there's like some sensors or something in her skin that detect it. They never said that, but... Maybe that's what it is. That would be giving the movie extreme benefit of the doubt. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I don't think it's earned it. Yeah, I think at the at the end of the day, this is just uh, alien an alien ripoff where they were like, "Hey, let's." You know, it almost feels like a Roger Corman film in a lot of ways. You have a movie like Alien that comes out, and then you have like the Roger Corman version where they just amp up the boobs in it, and that's what this feels like. Obviously, it's on a little bit of a higher level than something like that. But at the same time, it's, there were three sequels that came out and each one was would, like progressively worse. I was about to ask you uh, about your opinion uh, on the three species sequels. Yeah, so naturally, I did watch all of them for this for this uh, podcast. And the second one is probably the closest thing to like a proper sequel because it does feature uh, Michael Madsen, Natasha Henstridge and Marge uh, Helgenberger. At least in theaters. Yeah. And it was in theaters and it continues the, the story with uh, Natasha Henstridge's character being cloned. So like, what they say in the first one is that they have like several samples of this like alien, whatever DNA, not DNA, but like, I don't know what embryos or whatever. And they use that to make another one. And this is actually Marge Helgenberger's character who creates a clone of Syl, but she's like good sort of like, She's not, she doesn't have that like desire to, to like breed, I guess it's kind of ridiculous, but the, the plot of, of the sequel is that there's a, a space mission to Mars and while the, the astronauts are, are in Mars or on Mars, they get infected with the alien virus i guess i'm not even sure how if they know how this all works but basically the one guy astronaut becomes the the male version of natasha henstridge's character 
and he's like going around sleeping with all these women, impregnating them, and they give birth like in in like five hours or something. And so he's out there like just spreading this alien virus or whatever. It's not great. I mean, it's it's not as good as the first one, and and I, the first one's not very good. So you know, and and then. The ones after that were direct to sci-fi channel. The the, the yeah the uh, so the 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 third the third one involves Natasha Henstridge is actually in the beginning of the third one, but she's not in the rest of it, and it involves her daughter, and it's kind of uh, kind of ridiculous. So so like basically she she discovers that so the daughter does not have any kind of attraction towards any human because she looks at humans as like not a good species in general because it turned out that like all of those alien babies that that guy had were like all sick and stuff because the the human part of them was like not compatible so they were getting like diseases and stuff like that and they were like dying so what you have here is like all of these alien half breeds who are like just trying to kill people and and try to make their lives longer and stuff it's bad it's just it's not it's not good and then the fourth one is barely even worth discussing it's you just look at the cover and you can see what what this one's all about all about it this one this one is just uh, even more exploitative than the other ones it's really 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 bad (laughs) but i will say something that is that is pretty decent across all of them is the practical effects even in species the awakening which is the the fourth one from 2007 like that the the practical effects it's not horrible i mean it's not on the same level as the first two but you know it's 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 whatever but yeah the fourth one is obviously the worst one it's really bad i want i want to share this fact from the species the awakening wikipedia page and in a great thing that i feel like I, you never see it now <laughs> like a movie that feels like it lives into the stereotypes of being like a made for basic cable movie and a direct to video movie by basically being both it premiered on the sci-fi channel on september 29th 2007 and was released on dvd on october 2nd (laughs) yeah uh yeah now dvd is usually released on tuesdays which actually adds to this because then that implies i believe that the movie premiered on a saturday and saturdays are usually not peak television viewing hours yeah that's interesting i mean maybe maybe it was like a special event you know mm-hmm. it was like a it could, it could have been like a like uh like this week this the slumber party massacre remake is going to be on sci-fi and it's on like wednesday night or something which is like a weird <laughs> it's like a weird time too well uh, i i think you know we're we're gonna. I'm I'm trying not to drag us too far into a tangent about television, vision like scheduling. But look up, follow me for a second. The networks started de-emphasizing, like the broadcast network started de-emphasizing Saturdays. They used to make it another scheduling day before just dropping it altogether. They don't even schedule anything in it anymore. It's just reruns, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and. You also think that scheduling doesn't matter quite as much anymore because of even things that are being shown on, like the traditional broadcast networks, a lot of their viewing is going to come from streaming. But but that does not apply to a sci-fi channel original movie in 2007. (laughs) No, it doesn't. Also, this is like going even further down the, the, the rabbit hole, but I find it interesting now that you have shows like the, like FX on Hulu type thing where it's like shows that I think are just on the FX Hulu thing. Like, I don't know if they even air on FX, like the channel because 
when you see them, like Why the Last Man, for instance, or Re- Reservation Dogs, or uh, What We Do in the Shadows, like those are totally not appropriate for cable. Like the amount of of profanity and and like nudity in those, I don't think is would pass on cable. Yeah, basic cables in this weird position where they are not in any way regulated by the FCC. It has no jurisdiction over them, but they still kind of are broadcast friendly adjacent. I guess just for advertising reasons. I mean, in in the same sense, and I'm sorry, this is getting even worse now. That the FCC only has specific jurisdiction over the broadcast networks until 10 p.m. Mm-hmm. So technically, you could put something on at 10 p.m. that goes beyond what you typically would expect on broadcast except they don't because if you're airing it at 10 p.m on the east and pacific time zones it's going to be on at nine in the central and mountain time zones oh yeah that's what happens if like so they could say uh on the occasions in the past when the fcc would get so many complaints that have to go after a, a broadcast if it was you know outside of their jurisdiction airing at 10 p.m on the east and eastern Pacific time zones, they would just go after the uh, central and mountain broadcasts. Hmm. Interesting. And fine at the affiliate level. They don't find the network. They'll just say, you know, such as CBS was fined $3 million for whatever. They fine every individual affiliate that aired it. They split the fine. <laughs> yeah, I did know that. I knew about the, yeah. the fine splitting with the, the affiliates. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, TV's weird now. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's, all, it's all weird now. Um, so yeah, I, uh, uh, species. Uh, it's a it's a pretty bad series. It, it's kind of interesting to revisit it now in 2021. But if you are looking to do so, I would only recommend the first one. I would probably not. I would not bother with the sequels. Drink, or drink forever. Smell my feet. They won't let us go. Give us something good to eat. You kidnapped the four missing people. Watch Night of the Jackal Lantern on an all new Goosebumps today at 9 on Fox Kids Monster Rama Saturday. But beware, you're in for the one and only scare. Make them! Our third feature this month is the sophomore film from director Paul W.S. Anderson, his follow up to the successful Mortal Kombat adaptation. Released on August 15th, 1997, this is Event Horizon. A haunted ship. I'm getting some really strange readings in here. A missing crew. This place is a tomb. DJ, where are you? An infinite evil. This ship has been beyond the boundaries of our universe. Who knows what it's brought back with it? Vacate! I want off this ship. You can't leave. She won't let you. Event Horizon. Rated R. A rescue crew investigates a spaceship that disappeared into a black hole and has now returned with someone or something new on board. And there you, there you have it. Event Horizon. Ken, what'd you think of this one? Uh, this is my first time watching it. I, for a minute, I thought I might have seen this movie before, but I didn't remember. And then after I watched it, I thought this is not a movie that you just kind of forget. <laughs> No, you definitely remember this one. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's a movie that I th- I'm, I'm going to keep coming back to. This is not the entirely lives up to what it shows it can be in its kind of most unhinged moments, but f- it's uh, when it's really working, it's it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, um, I would I would say that this is like a it's sort of like Hellraiser in space. And, yeah. I mean, what you have here, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to, again, just spoil this movie, uh, is the Sam Neill plays this, uh, ki- this scientist who develops this like faster way of traveling through black holes or whatever. And he inadvertently opens up a, a portal to hell, really. And it, causes a lot of really horrific things to happen on, on board the ship. And that lends itself to some really interesting and pretty scary moments. If I do say so memorable moments, like the, there's a scene when one of the characters is, he, he basically gets sucked into this like portal thing comes back out and he's, I guess, possessed 
and he puts himself in the airlock to the ship. And then the demon or whatever's inhabiting him leaves. So he yeah. turns back to normal, but he's in the airlock. There's like a countdown sequence. They can't override it. The airlock opens and you get to see what happens when, you know, somebody who's not in a spacesuit is exposed to the, uh, the vacuum of space. And it's a, uh, it's a memorable, it's a very memorable scene. Like the one thing I, I saw this movie, I don't know, ages ago when I was younger. And one thing I remember seeing, I'll never forget is the scene when he looks at his arm and the, the veins in his arm, just all like suddenly bulge out. And you're just like, oh my God, this guy is about to have the worst death ever. And there, and there, there's, there's several other scenes like this, like that in this movie. Uh, I, the, the fact that one of the guys gets ejected out into space, he's in a suit, but he's like f- just free floating through space. And you're just like, oh my God. He turns out to be the best, I think, one of the best characters in the movie. I believe that was Richard T. Jones as Cooper. Mm-hmm. But it's it's not a it, it's not a conventionally good good movie. I agree with no. you that it does squander a lot of the opportunities that it has uh, because it's. I I don't think it does a very good job of of fully articulating the 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 situation that they're in like i feel like they 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 go they go pretty far and they show some horrific things but i don't think that there's enough substance there to back up those those set pieces and often what you have is uh another movie that feels very reminiscent of aliens you have a crew on a spaceship this the ship you know is dark and dank and it looks very Giger esque and you know, they're, they're trying to escape from pretty much like the ship itself. It's, it's not like there's an actual creature, but they're like, you know, haunted by visions of things in their past and all of that stuff. And, you know, it's a lot of cool ideas, but I feel like there's just not a, a, not quite enough, uh, here went a little bit more. yeah it's um i and then i think when you go back and look at the story of this movie being made it feels like the movie can always sort of be defend its existence under the case of like this is a movie that was very much rushed and when you watch i'll get to that in a second but when you watch it and you think like this feels like it could have been even more just unhinged there's also the the notion that it was there was originally a much longer director's cut that apparently was exactly that but it appears that they don't have the footage anymore oh man we need to start a release an anderson cut yeah yeah Mm. no apparently it's just like yeah the the story that is that it's was like the, the the test audiences um did not like it because it was too i don't know you don't know how much of this is just lore and how much of it's true uh the story i'm reading on the again the story i'm reading on the event horizon wikipedia article although it does appear that this is which is sourced to a like youtube q a so who knows (laughs) uh which is allegedly the audiences audiences were like physically distressed by how extreme this cut was um the uh the studio executives had not really been keeping up with the production of it so some of the execs at the screening were seeing this for the first time they're like this is what they've been making this whole time (laughs) and then ordered them they're like you can't we can't we can't do this uh uh, but it's interesting because it does go back to like the movie was rushed because it was made entirely in response to the fact of paramount it was made in this time frame in response to Paramount realizing that Titanic was not going to make July 97 have to go to December. So they were like, we need something to put out in the summer and market at market it as our big summer movie. And they ended up with event horizon, <laughs> a, which is the an over the top gory a sci-fi horror movie. I'm sorry. You're going to have to wait until Christmas till Titanic. This will have to do in the meantime. 
<laughs> this is the funniest possible answer to what's the movie you put in the summer because you can't get Titanic yet. Oh my god. Uh yeah, I still so I I do have kind of a soft spot for any any movies like this. Sci-fi horror movies that take place on like derelict ships and stuff like that. I'm I'm a huge fan of the Alien franchise. Uh probably my favorite series movie series of all time. And so anytime movies like this come out, I'm I'm I always have a soft spot for them. Even if like this, the story's not the best, and that the characters are a little, are a little one note, uh, I think that there is still a lot of fun to be had here. And I've seen Event Horizon numerous times at this point, and I still enjoy it. Like I don't, I don't think it's a particularly great movie or anything like that. I don't think it has a lot to say or anything, but I think as far as like effective, memorable sci-fi horror movies go, I think that this definitely checks all the boxes for me and i think that there are some good performances in here too you have a really good cast uh lawrence fishburne i think is awesome in this as miller he just is in he 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 has such a commanding presence that anytime he plays like a leader anytime he's in like a leadership role in, in a movie like he's just so believable like i'm just like I will follow Lawrence Fishburne wherever I'll do whatever he tells me to do because he has just such a commanding presence. And Sam Neill is really great in this too, because it's, it's always nice when you're in a movie, when Sam, when you see a Sam Neill movie where he goes crazy, because Sam Neill does a really good job of going crazy in move in his movies. And, uh, he definitely goes crazy in this one. So yeah, I was a, I was a fan of, uh, pretty much the whole cast, uh, Sean, Pertwee as well. I, I like that dude and pretty much everything he's in. So enjoy the cast. I think it's interesting. I think Paul W S Anderson is an interesting director just to discuss in general. Cause like, you know, he, he, he does mortal Kombat and then drops, you know, this event horizon movie. Oh, actually, you know what? I lied in the script. He did. It looks like he did a movie called Shopping before Mortal Kombat. Yeah, this is his third feature. I didn't see that this Shopping movie was... Yeah, I, don't, I didn't know anything about that. Yeah. Anyway, like, uh, Paul W.S. Anderson's, like, one of these weird directors that seems to always fail up. And, yeah. And I, I find him very fascinating because, like, every, every single one of his movies is bad. Like, every one of them. Now... Whether or not they make money, whether or not they're fun in like a dumb, stupid, horrible sort of way. Like that's a different conversation. But like as far as good movies, like, come on, this is the guy who made like 37 Resident Evil movies. He did that Pompeii disaster movie. He, he did Monster Hunter, which came out last year, which was a funny, which is the funny one, because this was like they released Monster Hunter during a time when. No movies were being released in theaters. All the theaters were still closed down. And every movie was coming out on digital. You know, this is like after Warner Brothers started releasing their stuff on HBO Max. And for some reason, they were like, nah, dude, Monster Hunter, you got to get the big screen experience for this one. (laughs) And they insisted on releasing it in theaters and nobody saw it. Of course. <laughs> it's the feeling that I thought it's this, like, excuse me. This is the same kind of reaction that I had learning about, you know, thinking about the release of monster hunter that I had a few couple months ago. I caught up with, uh, as, as its tagline says, the title is Russell Crowe is unhinged. Um, so I was watching Russell Crowe is unhinged and thinking about how, when this movie came out, it was like the first major release in theaters in months. And I'm finishing watching it and I'm like, this is the movie they thought people were going to come back to the theaters for. Yeah. I forgot about that movie. Eh, it's not great. No, I can't. I can't. Well, you know what? I did see monster hunter and I can tell you right now that that is not great either. Well, that's the thing about, uh, uh, Paul W.S. Anderson, as we have to call him. Uh, 
is because there were strangely two directors named Paul Anderson who both sort of emerged around the exact same yeah, time. Exactly, yeah, exactly. And, and Paul W.S. Anderson just used to go as Paul Anderson. So really, Paul Thomas Anderson is the usurper to interrupt Paul W.S. Well, he, Anderson. He used career. to go as P.T. Anderson, right? Didn't he? Yeah, you think they just so, sit them down and say, you get to be P.T. and you get to be Paul. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that, like, I don't think that you would get them confused as P.T. and Paul. But Paul W.S. No. and Paul, and Paul Thomas, that's, a, that's so more confusing. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the, the thing about um, Paul W.S. Anderson uh, is that he, I think he's like kind of like when we talk about, you know, these sort of genre film directors that a certain subset of critics have liked to, to kind of write about and praise. Uh, he's like up there with um, Michael Bay when you're looking at these movies and you're like, I, for whatever else you could say, it, this is something. They're, uh, yeah, they're they're consistently inconsistent, that's for sure. Yeah. I, yeah, I just, uh, I years ago, several years ago, I think it was probably when the last Resident Evil movie came out, Resident Evil, the final chapter in 2016. I did a marathon where I watched all of the Resident Evil movies. I like I binged them in like one or two days, and it was it was so much fun. Like I had a great time with it. Like all the movies are awful. Like I I really thought that. I mean, some of them were just barely watchable, but I still I still had a really uh, fun time with it, despite how bad despite how bad they were. So I don't know. There's he's a He's definitely an interesting director. I mean, anytime a movie comes out with his name on it, I immediately am like, oh, okay, well, I'm not going to see that. And then I end up seeing it, like, when it comes out on VOD or whatever. So, I don't know. <laughs> He's just an interesting character, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> who makes consistently bad movies, and yet still manages to get work. Like, a lot of work. He's got another one. He's working on one right now. With, uh... Mila Jovovich and Dave Batista. It's called In the Lost Lands. A sorceress travels to the lost lands in search of a magical power that allows a person to transform into a werewolf. <laughs> oh, it's uh, based on a story by George R. R. Martin. Huh. All right. So there's that. Yeah. Yeah. Overall, I, I would give Event Horizon a... a a light recommend. I, I like it. I still I still enjoy it. You gotta you gotta see it. You have to understand. Like we can't describe this movie as much as we can try. No, I mean it's you pretty gotta. it's pretty intense. I mean I've seen a lot of gory movies and stuff, and this one, I mean, maybe it was just like the age that I first saw it, but this one just has some stuff that definitely stuck with me over the years. And and keep in mind that if these, you know, sort of the legend about it is true, this is the toned down version of it. Yeah, man. I this would, is the heavily edited cut. I would love to see a director's cut of this movie. Holy crap, that would be awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our final title this month is a low-budget Canadian sci-fi horror film that also sparked a series of sequels and an upcoming remake. Directed by Vincenzo Natale and released on September 11th, 1998, this is Cube. Does anybody remember how they got here? Why would they throw innocent people in here? Are we being punished? There's a way in here, so there's got to be a way out. Do you think they'd go to all the trouble to build this thing if we could just walk out? Take a good long look around. Cause I got a feeling it's looking at us. We have about three days without food and water before we're too weak to move. I just want to wake up. I looked in the room down there and something almost cut my head off. Motion detectors integrated into the walls. Six complete strangers with widely varying personalities are involuntarily placed in an endless maze containing deadly traps. Now, so, Adam, if that doesn't hook you, then I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what what would. I. I mean, that's yeah. I was a big fan of Cube uh, for a long, long time. Long, long time. I saw it many, many years ago, and it was like right up my alley. I always have an affinity for movies that are framed like this movies that involve, you know, people trapped in some kind of weird situation, 
movies where people are forced to play games uh even like the the like newer like it's the escape room movies like i don't they're not great or anything but anytime a new one comes out i'll go see it because i just like this kind of movie and i i like the first escape room i haven't seen the second one yet but i, I will th- soon i think the second one's better actually but really yeah i think that the rooms are cooler and and re- like literally that's all i see those movies for is just yeah just the traps and the rooms and the the puzzles like that's the only reason i see those so anyway um I so I so I go into movies like this like already into the idea. I, I like the mystery aspect of it of like these people, they don't know how they're not only do they not know why they were chosen, but we don't know like what this is. These are like literally just rooms that lead to other rooms and some of them have traps and some of them don't and there's like T- uh, these like plaques that have numbers on them and you don't know what those lead to. So there's like this huge mystery that there's so much intrigue in a movie like this. And there's a lot of things that I like about cube, but to to just start off, I'll say that I think that it is a, a very well crafted movie, especially given the, uh, the low budget of it. Mm hmm. No, yeah, it does a lot with what you assume are quite limited uh, resources. And it's just, it's a movie that I can't entirely say that I'm completely, like, drawn through to all throughout. But I have to really kind of admire just on the level of uh, just how much it tries, and whether it succeeds is a different question, how much it tries to commit to, like, just, it's completely intentionally bizarre premise and just has this kind of confidence in itself just to launch the audience completely into it from the start. Yeah, because they, I mean, everything is kept pretty ambiguous throughout the whole movie. And even, even the end, you're just like, there's not a big reveal or anything. I mean, there is sort of, but it doesn't answer all the questions that you probably have by the end, which I think is totally fine in this, in this circumstance. Uh, I, I, I had issues mostly with the script. I mm-hmm. I don't think that the script is very well done as far as the dialogue. No. I like the story. I think that this the story in and of itself is cool. I like the idea of the traps. I, I like everything about the cube, the design, all of that stuff. But I think that where this movie falters and where it really shows its sort of low budget trappings is in the the dialogue and the performances i think that people are many many of the performers in this are overacting and just way too intense uh throughout most of it and i think that there are certain things that they do in the movie that are both not really characteristic of human beings and also annoying like the whole button thing I think is like super annoying because you know, they, the one guy, once they realize that they don't have any water, they are like, Oh, we're going to do. And this guy like is like suck on your buttons or whatever. And for the next like 15 minutes, they make such a point to show them sticking these buttons in their mouth and chewing on the buttons. And it's like, all right, I get it. You're sucking on your buttons. Just let's not, put so much emphasis on it because it's dumb and annoying. It's the interesting, by, by interesting, I mean unfortunate combination of over-dialed performances of badly written characters. Yeah, and like, like several of the characters are, I would say all the characters are actually poorly written, uh, honestly. Yes. Like, they're, they're not, none of them are good. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you have this Holloway character who is a doctor and she is so erratic through the whole movie. She calls the one guy a Nazi, which I thought was pretty funny. (laughs) Like she just randomly calls this dude a Nazi. Um, She is so, she's just so grating that character. And I get it. Like these people are under a tremendous amount of stress. There's, gonna be moments where they lash out at each other because they're all strangers they don't know each other 
they're not exactly in a l- low intensity situation. Yeah. So I understand that the stress level is high and that, you know, there's going to be some crazy emotions going on here, but some of the stuff that they say, some of the stuff that they do, especially towards the end with the, the Quentin character, you're just like, what? what? Like this guy's supposed to be a, a cop and he's doing this. Like it just, uh, makes very little sense and feels like they just needed to add one extra layer of, of, uh, of like stress and, um, you know, something to, to ramp up the, 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 the tension a little bit more by making him like crack and go nuts and try to kill him. So, uh, yeah, Yeah. a lot, pretty much all of those aspects I thought really caused the movie to suffer, but at the same time, I still enjoyed, uh, I still enjoyed it overall. Yeah. I, I mean, it's a movie where I think you look at it and on one level it, it is, it does suffer in the sense that you have to spend time with these badly written characters, but there's just so much around them that is so interesting. And, oh, and like I said, a movie with the courage of its, uh, own abilities to just kind of go for it um and to see kind of how this movie has had you can see its sort of residual effects and impact uh on other movies as you're watching it yeah i mean l- looking at this like i i don't know i'm sure there were movies that were similar maybe before this but to me this feels like a very influential film in that it it came out in 1997 this is you know before Saul this is before a a lot of these movies that involve people being waking up in mysterious places and need to figure out how they're going to escape like it seems like it was a pretty early uh yeah you know one one of those types of movies I I think it's also interesting that we watch this so close to like uh, right around when the Squid Games phenomenon is is happening, which I think is really I've funny. Heard so much about that, and I have not investigated it at all. I think it's so funny that like that show's been out for like several weeks, and then all of a sudden it just like went viral on the on the internet. Mm-hmm. But it's been out for a little bit, and then now all of a sudden it's just like everywhere. It just caught on like wildfire. It's a great show, but yeah, uh, there are two sequels to this. Cube Two Hypercube is the first one. Uh, it is atrocious. It's the same concept, but it like goes way off the rails as far as the technical aspect of it. The thing I liked about what happens in the first cube is that it all feels man-made. Like, sure, these tra- a lot of some of the traps don't really make sense, like like physics wise. But in Cube 2 Hypercube, it's just, they go nuts with it. Like, there, there's, like, invisible walls that are killing people. Uh, some of the rooms are, the gravity is reversed in them. So, so like, you, you crawl in and then you, like, fall up. Uh, it, it just throws everything out the window. And it's, like, completely supernatural. Like cube. It's the Fred Astaire room. Yeah, it, it, it's it's wild. Like there's and everything is CG in the second one. So in the first one, you have some CG looking elements, very rudimentary type stuff. But it all looks fine because most of it is like they they keep things pretty low key as far as the traps in the first one. I really like the opening sequence too. By the way. Yeah, oh, uh, I, I think it was a really strong way to open it because it tells you everything you need to know. This this dude wakes up in a room, he goes into the next room, and this like fence thing just demolishes him, and it's that's all you need to know. So, as far as opening scenes for movies go, it's pretty great. Yeah, and the effects looked really good too. To this day, actually, they they yeah, they, they yeah. stand up. I I I think what we were talking about the cube and like the construction of the cube. Uh, uh, I'm. I've just I'm on the IMDb page of the cube to look at something that I'd come across a little while ago and I wanted to share again. You know how on IMDb they have FAQs with questions that no one has ever asked about a movie? Mm-hmm. Um <laughs> where it's like I think this was just generated by a, by a computer. Uh that one of the three is 
how could anyone build a cube that big? <laughs> but that's almost a question. The other two, I think, really deserve scrutiny. Uh, the uh, second one is, is cube based on a book? <laughs> Which I don't know why that's so funny to me. That's one of the ones that come up. And the number one question, apparently, is... Well, you think that you might ask a question after you've watched it and you have more questions. But the number one question on the cube FAQ is, what is the cube? <laughs> Hmm. I'm sorry. I've I've just watched Cube. I put it on. I walked out of the room for 95 <laughs> minutes. Cube? I came back in and it was over and I have questions. <laughs> I mean, what is this Cube? The final exam in my Cube 101 class is tomorrow and I have questions about Cube. <laughs> oh my. That's 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 fun. <laughs> So cube cube two hypercube is uh, a tr I, I would say atrocious. Like I really did not like where they went with the second one, and then in the third one, which is called Cube Zero, they went back and it's like a prequel, and that is again more slightly more grounded than than hypercube, but still a little bit more over the top than the original one, and they. Getting a little bit into the the lore a, a bit more with Cube Zero as far as like how the cube works and stuff, but not really. Like they they don't really get into it, and it gets like goofy. Like it gets straight up goofy in uh, the third one. So uh, yeah, the sequels are are quite bad, I would say, and are not really necessary. Like if you have a lot of burning questions after seeing the first one. Don't don't bother seeing the sequels because you're you're not gonna get those answers out of the sequels. Do they ever tell me what the cube is? <laughs> no. <laughs> How many three digit prime numbers are there? Is one of the questions. Uh I have to imagine that the cube was and, and you know what? I might have I interviewed Vincenzo Natali like year so many years ago and I might've asked him this, but I could, I don't remember the, <laughs> what I asked him and asked uh, him the cube was. <laughs> I did not, I should have, but asked I think, I think cube. I asked him like how many cubes there were. And I think he said it was just one. They, they built one cube and then the hallway and then they just reused it. I like that. The answer to how many three digit prime numbers are there. They list all the three. digit <laughs> <Yeah>. prime <numbers. laughs> It's just a list. Of prime <laughs> numbers. This is a fascinating... The IMDb FAQ questions, which feature questions, like, like I said, I can not imagine have ever been asked, much less frequently asked. I... It's... This is a fascinating place. This is underused. I have to come back to these more. <laughs> <laughs> well, they... They're very... They're particularly good in, in this movie. I, I, they, yeah, they're, they're just... They're very good in this movie. What is outside the cube? Who lives? Who dies? I like this one. It's very philosophical. Without any idea of who built the cube and why, how are we to interpret the movie? <laughs> mm. You have to think it's aliens. Uh, like, just especially judging by the sequel, you have to just... It's. I think that it, it, the best interpretation is that, like, aliens sent down the design and are, like, requiring us to put people in the cube to like appease them or something like that. Maybe more gets to explain in cube zero that I just can't remember, but which is funny because I literally just watched it like two days ago. Whatever. What's nuts to me here is that one of some of these are like questions you might ask after watching the movie. If you didn't think of anything else to ask, like, do the colors have any meaning? Like, I don't know. Like you, you'd imagine those are the, like the, the, the bad questions you'd get at like a Q and a or something. But then yeah. there's what is the cube? <laughs> How many? Hey, I want. I would love to see that in a in a, a Q and A se sh session. Uh, yeah. Hi. How many three digit prime numbers are there? <laughs> <laughs> Any, yeah. So I I like cube. I like the original. I think that the sequels are are not very good. To be clear, Vincenzo Natale had absolutely nothing to do with the uh, the sequels. He didn't want to do them or anything like that. He doesn't 
support them or any of that. But uh, yeah, the the first one's pretty good. And as far as Vincenzo Natale's stuff goes, uh, I th- I think that I don't know. No, the rest of his other movies were not really. So he did Splice, and I really hated Splice. I did not like where that movie went at all. Mm-hmm. Um, there he did Haunter. What did I? Can't... Oh, this is the one with Abigail Breslin. Yeah, that's bad too. Uh, yeah. Un- unfortunately, his l- later movies were not really uh titles that I, that I that really resonated with me. He did a bunch of uh like TV episodes and stuff too. He did some Westworld and Hannibal, which I think he was a really good choice for Hannibal. He did like six episodes of that, two episodes of Lock and Key, which I I like that show. So he did a movie from Netflix a couple years ago in the Tall Grass. Yeah, yeah, that movie starts off, and, and this is not a knock on him. I think that, that it's just the the story. Is, the thing, the thing about In the Tall Grass is that it starts off so good, and you're just like, "Oh my god, what, what could this possibly be?" And the thing is, like, the intrigue gets so built up that when you inevitably do find out what's going on, it's a bit of a letdown. But uh, it, it starts off really great. People just lost in some grass. People just lost in grass. It could happen. Yeah. Uh, all right. Anything else that you want to add about uh, Cube before we close it out this month? No, nah, that's about it. I'd say watch it, you know? Yeah. It's not great, but it's interesting. Yeah, it's a pretty pretty solid indie sci-fi horror movie where they, they were able to, you know, do a lot with a little and create a uh, a pretty interesting story while they're at it. You just got to you got to give them a little bit of a a little bit of a pass for the the characters and the dialogue and the acting cuz it's just uh, yeah, it's a little rough. A little rough around the edges on that. Yeah. All right, I I think that that's going to do it for this month. I hope everyone has a fun and safe Halloween. Let us know your favorite 90s horror movies by sending us an email at 90s at filmpulse.net or sending us a DM on Twitter or Facebook at 90s pod. Till next month, for Ken Bakley, my name's Adam Patterson. This has been Saved by the 90s. Bye, everyone.